Well, amen. It's good to see you. It's good to be back, isn't it? It's been a whole week, and I'm excited about being here, fired up about um, what God has got planned for us today because we're continuing our study in the book of Ruth, and we have looked at the two daughters. But today we are going to take a look at Naomi, an in-depth look at how she responded to tragedy in her life. Her name, Naomi, means blessed one or, or sweet one, precious one. She's had some trials in her life, and they changed. She changed her name. And instead of being called the precious lady, the sweet lady, she became known as Mara, which means bitter one. Now, we're going to look at her life, but let me just give you an overview of it. Her husband moved her away from her family, and they moved to a, a town where uh, they, they worshiped a different god. The living conditions were just as bad there. Ended up that she lost her, her two sons to death. Her, her husband died. She ended up with nothing. All of her family was, was back at home. And her heart was bitter. It was, it was bitter toward, toward God and toward everyone. Her life was broken. There's a story of two monks who were walking, and they came across this lady who was trying to uh, cross a, a, a river, a small stream or small river, and uh, the lady couldn't actually ford it because there was the water was too swift. And so the monks said, well, that's not a problem. We'll help you cross it. And so... The uh, one, the younger monk grabbed the lady and put her on his back and walked across the river and took her to the other side and then she went on her way and he came back and they started walking and as they were walking they got 10 or 15 minutes down the, down the river and the younger monk looked at the, his, his buddy and he said, he said, my back is, is killing me. And, um, the older monk says, well, I know why. And um, he said, yeah, it's because I carried that woman across the, the, the river. And the elderly monk said, no, that's not the reason. The reason that your back is hurting you now is that you're still carrying her. Put her down. Stop carrying the weight that's on the other side of the river. Now, I don't know the physics of all that and how it works physically, but I know what the monk was saying mentally. We hurt because of things we're still carrying that we should have put down a long time ago. And we did put them down, but for some reason we still carry them. And we're going to look at what it means to be bitter. What it means to live a life that is marked by bitterness. But we're not going to leave you there today. We sing about blessed be your name. And we're going to sing a new song. It's called Ever Be. Now, let me read you some of the lyrics to this song. It may be new to you. It was brand new to me. Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today. Faithful you have been and faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me, and it's why I sing, your praise will ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. He is forever going to be the reason that we sing. He's forever going to be there with us. He made a covenant of old with us, an enduring covenant that he's never going to, to break. And no matter what weight we're carrying, no matter what bitterness we're going through, know that, that we exist to connect you to God, to others, and to your purpose. And God has a purpose for you. He has a covenant relationship with you. 
And forever he's going to be the one that you need. Now for two weeks we've talked about relationships and our responsibility in those relationships. How we're never to break a covenant. How we're to always be faithful and it's up to us to be faithful. I want you to know that for two weeks I've been talking about Jesus Christ's relationship with you. No matter what you do, he will ever be there. No matter what. Father, we give you praise and honor. We glorify your name today and lift you up. And we ask, Father, that during this time you, you help us as we sing these words to internalize them and to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you, Father, you will never leave us. You're here with us. And your praise will ever be on our lips no matter what we carry. In your name I pray, Father. Amen. You will want to find Ruth chapter 1 in your Bible. And um, we'll be talking this morning um, about several different passages in Ruth 1. And so you'll want to have it. Uh, I don't have slides for you today. I want you to be able to see it with you right there uh, and make notes in, uh, in your text. And we're going to be pretty much all, all through um, the book of Ruth. I mean, the first chapter of Ruth in several different verses. So um, hold on to that. You know, um, uh, last week we talked about, excuse me, we talked about Ruth and we talked about her commitment to Naomi, her commitment to the covenant, her commitment to the relationship. The week before that we talked about uh, Orpah and how she took the uh, the easy road and 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 left everything, uh, and the, the the two could not have been more stark in differences between uh, Orpah and Ruth. And of course, the name of the book is Ruth, so you you know immediately who who God's side is on. But in in between those two is a, a lady named Naomi, and we find Naomi. Um, in what we're going to talk about today, making the right decision, but doing so with the wrong spirit. Making the right decision, but doing so in the wrong spirit. We're talking about the burden and the bitterness of a barren life and what happens to us as, as our life builds on, on bitterness and where we, where we come from. So, um, it is by far much better to make the right decision with the wrong attitude than to make the wrong, wrong decision with the wrong attitude. But what I want, us, want you to see today is that God's calling us to a, to a higher standard than just doing right. Okay? So I was in a preaching class and a really cool preaching class. We got to listen to other guys preach and then evaluate them. And the person that was our professor, uh, he taught people like Adrian Rogers and, and a lot of other wonderful pastors uh, the art of, of, of preaching. And one thing that he said that we needed to watch for is that when we preach and we preach against sin, don't act like we like it. Okay, when we preach and we talk about people that are going to burn forever, eternally in hell, that Jesus talks about, he says, "Don't do that with a smile on your face either." He said, "Those, our our attitude will come forth." And I was like, "Man, who would do that? Who would actually preach a sermon like it?" And lo and behold, I was invited to a revival, and I went to this revival, and this guy got up and started preaching, and everything he said was pretty much spot on. The only problem was, was that I got the vibe that he was glad that God was doing it. He, he, was, he was talking about people that were living in sin and how God was going to punish them and he was like, yay God, get them, get them, yay, and he was happy about it. So I understood that you can have the right words, you can have the right action, but the wrong attitude makes everything bad. So Naomi, we're going to see she did everything right, okay? But the end result was horrific because of an attitude. So let's, let's read first Romans. Romans, Ruth, uh, we're not even in Romans all day today. Uh, Ruth chapter 1, uh, beginning with verse 5. 
But Mahon and Chilon also died. Those are Naomi's children. And Naomi was left without her two children and without her husband. She and her daughters-in-law set out to return from the territory of Moab because she had heard in Moab that the Lord had paid attention to his people's need by providing them food. She left the place where she had been living, accompanied by her two daughters-in-law, and traveled along the road leading back to the land of Judah. Okay, a couple of things. Here's something that's an aside as they left uh, Bethlehem. is because there was a famine in the land and, and people were starving. Can you bring up the house lights, please? And uh, people were starving. And uh, so they went to Moab where they could get more food and things like that. Well, um, just like God, God took care of that. You, did you read that part? Where they heard that God's people were okay. Big surprise, okay? Big surprise. God's people are okay. Has nothing to do with the lesson, but it's kind of cool that they left, and lo and behold, God was taking care of it, so everything was all right. All right, so back to the message. Um, nobody, nobody with, with half a brain cell can say that the, the heartache and the pain that Naomi going through no, Naomi went through and the disappointment that she felt uh, were illegitimate. Guys, you can't minimize the burden that this lady's carrying. She's lost her husband and her two children. That's tough. I guarantee you she felt overwhelmed, don't you think? Here she is in a foreign land completely coming unraveled. In 10 years, I want you to look at what she lost in a 10-year span. In verse 1, I mean in verse 5, she lost her husband. In verse 5, she lost her children. In verse, she also lost her security. In verse 21, she loses her possessions. In verse 19, she loses her status. She also loses her reputation. And verse 13, we'll see in more detail later, that she has lost her closeness with God. Now, guys, if anybody deserved to be depressed, discouraged, disappointed, overwhelmed, or bitter, it was Naomi. Are you following me? I think that the first... The first step in dealing with bitterness is just admitting you have a right to be bitter. You're in a situation that, that may or may not be of your own choosing. I'll get to that later. But you're in a situation that is not ideal. And if you're going to deal with bitterness, lay it out. Write it out. This is where it is. This is what's happened. This is the bitterness. This is why I am where I am. These are the details. And, and spell it out, not just for you, but spell it out for God and for those around you. Because we're going to talk about a lady who was hurting and she cries out. And I didn't find anybody that came alongside her other than Ruth to help her where she is. And you may be that very person, but don't suffer in silence. Don't suffer in silence. Ask. Lay it out. Here it is. And, and we, when we hear and see someone, and uh, listen, I'm preaching to Ricky Ray right here, okay? You can listen if you want to. Um, but when you see someone in pain, when you see someone hurting, listen. Don't try to fix it. But listen and try to accept it wherever they are. Now, guys, if we have those ground rules, number one, you got to come forth. Number two, you got to listen. If we can have those ground rules in our family, at your place of work, where you go to school, if you have those, you'll change the culture. 
You'll change everything out. But we tried to judge Naomi too quickly, and, and uh, we tried to respond to her, um, her circumstances. And she hears that things are better in Bethlehem in verse 6, and so she goes, we, we've got to go back because she didn't have anywhere else to turn. And, and, and that's not bad in itself, okay? She did the right thing. She did the right thing. Go back. But even her motive, although it was her, your motives can be the best, if you've got the wrong attitude, it positions ourselves in a, in a place where we can't be restored by God. Are, are you following me? You've got to get this part. Let me say that again so that you'll catch it. Okay? Pause for dramatic effect. You ready for it? The whole point is for restoration with God. And you've got to get in a position to be restored. Let me use a personal illustration, okay, with my wife. She's not here. She's probably teaching the kids, okay? It's fourth Sunday. Is that right? I don't know. Which I don't see her. But she could confirm this. There are times when we argue, and I don't want to stop arguing. I'm still upset. I'm still mad. And I, I tell you, here, my, the most effective, no, not the most, my go-to move in an argument, get this, you ready for it? Not say a word. Yeah, I know. I know. That's your go-to? Oh, yeah. If I ever shut up, you know that there's something up. I'm mad, and I'm to the point where it's over. There's no more. I don't know about you, but my wife and I have this wonderful relationship where um, we sometimes talk about everything, and we don't agree about stuff, okay? And so that's just us, all right? And I get frustrated sometimes with this precious lady that, that her uh, her, her father calls sweetness and uh, has never done anything wrong, but that's beside the point. I don't want to get into that. Um, and, 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 and she gets frustrated with me, and then I will clam up, and I am in no mood to be talked to. I am in not a position to have that relationship restored. Are you following me? No. And if she comes to me, and she used to when she was, when we were first married back 20 something years ago she would come to me and she'd say say sweetheart or honey and and you know here's what happens <clears throat> death on the inside okay uh, on the inside it's like mm, mm, okay i don't want to talk can't you understand i don't want to talk when i want to talk i do what i talk i'm not talking leave me alone because right now I don't want a relationship with you, much less make this argument. I'm just, I'm done, okay? So all of that to say, I'm a stupid idiot, okay? Just dumb as a block. And sometimes I don't want the relationship restored because I'm so frustrated. And there's no way, no way, none, that I could ever get a right relationship with her until I change. Let me tell you how many times we have solved an argument by her changing her mind. That's right. I hate Don Merritt, by the way. Just as an aside, uh, he is our counselor, and we talk with him, and I have proof on text because I always get it in writing. He sides with Shinova every time. And why do you side with Shinova every time? She's always right. I'm getting a new counselor. It's, the, it's, it's frustrating to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Yesterday, it, we were at Lowe's, and she made a decision, a financial decision in Lowe's. And I said, I said but honey, and she said, Hold on a second. And I was like, wait a minute. No. She said, no. And I said, no, we're not having this conversation. We're going to do what you say, and I don't, that's it. And she goes, pushing the buggy. She was happy. I knew where it was going anyway. She's going to lay out her, her, her argument, and at the end, I was going to go, okay. 
That's where it was headed. So I cut out the, I cut out the middle man with me arguing and trying to present my logical side. She had already decided, point blank. Guys, until you come to the point in your life, ladies, until you come to the, to the, to the spot in your life where you realize that any time that there's bitterness, a burden, disappointment in your life, you're really disappointed with God. And he really wants to work with you in that situation, no matter how bad it is. And if you'll just give it to him, he'll restore the relationship. You see, because if you have a bad relationship with someone else, how does God put it? Don't worship me. That's how he puts it. If you've got something between you and a brother, then don't worship me. That's a weird relationship request. But if you've got an issue with a brother, fix that. Then worship me. How do you fix it? We're going to talk about that. We're going to share, I'm going to share with you how, how she got to the point where she could finally find a restoration but it begins by saying I need restored it begins by acknowledging that I am the issue that I am the problem and um, look at the bitterness that she harbored verse 13 uh, in, in Ruth chapter 1 look at verse would would you be willing to wait for them to grow up would you restrain yourself from remarrying no my daughters my life is much too bitter for you to share because the Lord's hand has turned against me Did you reach that now look at verse uh, 20 and 21 don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, she uh, answered. For the Almighty, the Almighty, catch that, has made me very bitter. He did it. He made me very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has opposed me and the Almighty has afflicted me. Dude, I want you to get this. She knows who he is. He's the Almighty. Catch that. He's Almighty. Okay, now, whenever we have emotional pain and we don't treat it, this is where we end up. God, who is almighty, can do everything, made me bitter. That's just wrong. Amen? Somebody say amen. That's just wrong. God doesn't make people bitter. He makes them better. You can't blame being bitter on God. Can't do it. She even calls him almighty, the almighty God. Made me the way I am. I used to have a friend. I say used to. We're still friends. We just don't talk a lot. He had a temper. Oh, son, he had a temper. And, and it was one of those tempers that one day something would make him upset. The next day it wouldn't. I, you know, you never knew. And one day I talked to him and I said, I said, um, uh, by his name. I said, dude, you, you got to stop doing this. And he said, he said, that's just who I am. That's just how God made me. And I was like, liar. Liar. That's not how God made you. God didn't do that to you. You did that. Don't blame God. God says, be angry and sin not. Is he going to make somebody? Check me. Is he going to make somebody that will break what he told them not to? Do this real quick. He's not going to make that person. No. No. Name your sin. God's not going to make somebody to be that person. No. It's wrong to be bitter. God tells us not to be bitter. Naomi said, but God made me this way. Well, that's easy. Just blame it on God. Let me tell you a few things that bitter people do. You ready for it? Number one, I'd write these down. They tend to blame others for their trouble. Now, I don't want to be insensitive. And I don't want you to come across thinking that I don't care. Because I do care. I do have a weird way of showing it, but I do care. And here's, here, here's the issue. Who caused the problem that Naomi has? Naomi. See, she and her husband left... <laughs> left the place that God said, if you stay here, I'll take care of you. And in verse 6, we find out that he did it. 
Well, Naomi and Elimelech left, and they went to Moab to take care of themselves. And what happened? Husband died and two kids died. I'm not being incentive, not being tongue-in-cheek, not being flippant about this. But my dear friends, uh, uh, I'm going to say this. Most of our problems were created by most of us. We did it. We got ourselves there. Look at the, how she says it. The hand of the Lord has gone out against me. The Almighty has dealt, with, dealt very bitterly with me. The Almighty has afflicted me. The word that she's using for, uh, to describe God here, the Almighty, that's El Shaddai. El Shaddai. Let me translate El Shaddai. It is a, he who is self-sufficient. He who doesn't need anybody. El Shaddai, all, all powerful, can do everything himself. She's saying that the self-sufficient person has knocked the props out from underneath my life. What a, what a crass way to look at God's, God's involvement. He that doesn't need anybody took away everything that I need. He knows that I'm puny, and so since he's all by himself, he's high and mighty, then he, he took all of my help. She's being very sarcastic and something and mean. She could have chosen 200 names for God at this point, but she chose the one El Shaddai, which means self-sufficient. The self-sufficient one has taken away that which I need. Man, this has got to make God's blood boil to look at this person. And, um, you know, why? Why does she blame God? Write these down. Write these three things down. Type them in a text note to yourself or something. Write this. Why do people blame God? Number one, we don't know who else to blame. We've got to blame somebody. We feel that we need to blame somebody. Number one reason, we don't know whom else to blame. Number two, we expect God to override the consequences of our personal failures. We expect God to override the consequences of our personal failures. One of my professors just released a book this past week. Uh, he taught a class, Genesis 1 through 11, and he just released a book this past week, and I got to thinking about him this week. His name was Dr. Skinner, so I called him Dr. Sinner uh, because I was that guy. And um, he's like six or 700 years old, and uh, he loves Mars bars. And uh, he, he ate so many Mars bars once that he actually had, had to have some kind of stomach surgery, and so I carried him a Mars bar to the hospital. And um, he's a good guy. I mean, um, he, he still passed me. But he released a book this past week, and, and uh, got me thinking about him. One of the things that he said was this. Um, if you are involved in an accident, and it's 100% your fault, and you cut off your leg, and what you're involved in is a sin against God, can God forgive you for that sin? The answer across the room is yes. Does God grow your leg back? The answer is, <laughs> sorry, Dave, Gary, the answer is, the answer is no. We have consequences. I didn't think about that when I used this illustration. It's pretty good. <laughs> Do what now? But it's different. I like that. It's one of those UK legs. I've seen that leg. Everybody all around town knows your UK leg. <laughs> See, there's consequences. There's consequences to everything. The third reason, okay, the reason people blame God. We expect God to fix things immediately, although it took years for us to get to where we are. If you survive your first heart attack, if you survive your first heart attack, you are likely to never have another one. You know why? Because most people who have a heart attack clean up their lifestyle after that. Weird science, how that works. You just shifted in your seat. I hope that means that it's okay. 
that the, the statistics I just quoted are true. When my brother had his first heart attack, I looked it up. I was like, he's probably going to die now. And they're like, no, he'll, he'll, the stati he'll get right. And I'm like, oh, I hope so. Now I'm nervous. I'm not going to preach about engineering today, just so you'll know. Where was I going? Oh, yeah. Physical, it took us years and years. And I, I hear people praying and asking God to fix their physical health, and it took them years to get where they are. Well, God didn't heal them. Well, it took 10 years to get there. Most of our bitterness that we blame upon God comes back to us. We ask God to help us with our children, but we raised them. And now they've made bad decisions, and we want God to heal them overnight. And yet we <laughs> spent years getting them to where they are. You see what I'm saying? hope I've stepped on everybody's toe. Okay? Um, bitter people tend to blame others for their, their situation. Also, bitter people tend to vent hostility on others. A bitter person is very easy to spot. They're usually critical, insensitive, and negative. They don't care about the people that they hurt. Sometimes they intend to hurt other people. Sometimes they don't. But the end result is the same. Bitter people hurt people. Look at Naomi. Naomi. Verse 8, she offered bad advice. She literally told Naomi and uh, she literally told Ruth and Orpah, go back to serving your false gods. That's horrible advice. It comes from a bitter heart, not a heart that's close to God. And bitter people offer bad advice. Nineteen ninety four. I led a wrestler to Christ. Big huge guy. His name was Bubba Payne. I baptized Bubba Payne. I carried him down. I walked over here, dunked him, walked back and lifted him up. Big guy. Bubba Payne, gentle sweetheart. His wife was the most precious lady on the planet. Had another guy that was a really good friend of mine. And um, the three of us got into a, an argument. And I got my buddy on my side. Because I, I didn't like Bubba. I didn't like what he was saying. Bubba, he was a Pittsburgh Steelers fan too. Oh, another strike. And um, that's enough right there, isn't it? And um, Bubba came to me to apologize. And after he apologized, I told him, I'm, Bubba, I don't care. I don't want to have anything else to do with you. Um, you've hurt me for the last time. Stuff like that. Bubba wrote a, a card, a note. He and his wife got, got this amazing card and in that card wrote it to my other friend um, because my other friend wouldn't meet with him. I told him, I said, he, he's just going to, he's going to apologize, but he's going to do the same thing. Eventually he'll do the same thing and he'll hurt you again. So he wouldn't meet with him, so Bubba, Bubba and his wife mailed, mailed him a card, and, and he got the card. And It was Tuesday night. It was visitation where we were going to share the gospel, and, and we're riding in, in, our, in my van, and um, my buddy pulls out this card. And he says, look at this. I got this from Bubba this week. And so I'm reading this card, and it's a, it's a sweet card. It's amazing. It's apologetic. It's, he's just pouring his heart out to my friend, and, um, and my friend looks at me and says, what do you think I should do with this? And I said, I know what's going on. Bubba doesn't like you because you and I are friends. And Bubba is, what he's trying to do is he's, he's 
pouring coals on top of your head. There's an Old Testament proverb. He's, he's, just, he's just being real nice to you because, he, because you're, he sees you as an enemy. So he's being real nice to you right now. But he's still your enemy. And he said, huh, he tore up the card. And I said, that's right. Bubba deserves that. See, I was bitter. And I gave my friend Michael some of the worst advice I'd ever given in my pastoral ministry. I didn't forgive Bubba, not because Bubba was unrepentant, but because I was too bitter. About three years later, I found out that Bubba and Michael got together and talked about it and decided that I was a bitter old man and they needed to be friends and to restore their relationship and praise God, by the mercies of Jesus, they became good friends again and their wives became good friends again. In spite of a bitter pastor that had issues with Bubba, it spilled over. Guys, be careful who you get advice from because bitter people give bad advice. Not only that, but look what else. She was insensitive to Ruth and Orpah's grief. She thought that her situation was more desperate than theirs. Read verses 12, 13, and 14, and 15. And, and it could have been she lost her husband and two kids. They only lost a husband. It could be, but that doesn't give her the right to diminish her grief. I've done several family funerals where, where the family members, well, I loved him more than you. He cared more about me than you. That doesn't give you the right to diminish the fact that they're grieving as well. But bitter people are insensitive. She also considered that Ruth and Orpah were as carnal as she was. Here Ruth is about to place her, 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 her belief in Jehovah and about to follow the God of, of Naomi, but all Naomi can talk about with Ruth is worldly matters. She lost focus. Bitter people also will depreciate the value of other relationships. Look at verse 21. She said, when Naomi came back, she said she was empty. Guys, she was with Ruth. I, re I, I left here full. I came back empty. All I got is Ruth. Got nothing. And it's so hard. <clears throat> to see our loved ones actually say, I've got no reason to live. Everything's horrible. And you're sitting there, am, am I chopped liver? Now, if you love chopped liver, that illustration doesn't make any difference to you, but chopped liver is nasty stuff, okay? It's just nasty. Who, who thought, we're so hungry, we've got to eat a liver? I got an idea, let's chop it up. That's terrible, okay? That's just terrible stuff. It's nasty. But don't that sometimes make you feel that way? Whenever you see people and, and you're talking to people and the, they're pouring their heart out to you and they're bitter and they actually say, nobody loves me. And you're like, I'm here, right here. Well, you don't count. You're empty. You're like Ruth. You're no value to me. And bitter people throw away the most valuable. I've seen kids throw mom and daddy away. You know, most mom and dads will die for their kids. You know that, right? And I've seen teenage kids, I hate you. I've seen children on, on um, addicted. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Now, why is that? It's the bitterness that's taken over in their life. It's the bitterness. And, and what God wants to do is God wants to heal your pain. God wants to renew your heart if you'll just allow him to. If you are at the point where you are lonely and you feel like you're fighting the world by yourself, 
That's bitterness talking somewhere. Some hurt has gotten in. And you need to let God in to renew that. And God to heal that pain. After all the, the pain, after losing all of her possessions, after losing relationships and destroying other relationships, what was Naomi's greatest need? As a child of God, her greatest need was to return to God. The theme of verse 1 is return. Of chapter 1 is return. It's the key word in all the chapter. In just 20-something verses, it's used nine times. That's a, a huge huge clue to what God's trying to say. And through it all, to return illustrates repentance. The, the theme is that you can rebuild Build, you can reclaim, you can return to any relationship if you're willing to return. If you're willing to repent, if you're willing to, to turn away. The key is to make a decision to salvage the relationship. God calls us to a relationship with him. And when we get out of that relationship, bitterness begins to build slowly and slowly like a sedimentary rock, layer after layer after layer until our heart, our heart is as hard as that rock built upon issues and things that happen to us that, that are meant to, to draw us closer, but instead they, they drive us further from the relationship with God. Let me tell you the story. The story is about Charlotte Elliott of, of uh, Brighton, England. She was an embittered woman. Mm. Her health was broken. She had a disability and she literally wrote, uh, wrote these words, if God loved me, he would not have treated me this way. A minister named Dr. Caesar Milan heard about um, Miss Elliot and heard about all the problems that she was going through and experienced. And so he came to visit her in May of 1822. That's right. 200 years ago. Wow. She invited him to stay for dinner, and um, that night as he was talking about the love and the mercy and the grace of God, she had lost her temper. And she um, started to rail against God. And in, in a, a violent outburst, she... Um, Embarrassed everybody. Her family actually got up from the table and left. They were so embarrassed by the things that she was saying, they left. But the uh, the ministers, Dr. Milan, stayed. He was sitting across the table from her. And after sitting in silence for quite some time, he looked at her and he said these words. You are tired of yourself, aren't you? 
You're holding to your hate and your anger because you have nothing else in the world to cling to. As a result, you have become sour, bitter, and resentful. Miss Charlotte said, what is your cure? He said, the faith that you so despise. In other words, the God that you've been railing against, he's your cure. If you want to get rid of the bitterness, Jesus is your cure. If you want to get rid of the resentfulness, Jesus is your cure. If you want your heart to be soft, and the one that you've been railing against, the one that you talked so badly about that your family was embarrassed enough that they got up from the table and left, that's your cure. After they talked for a while, she began to soften, and she said, if I wanted to become a Christian and to share the peace and the joy that you possess, what would I do? And he said, you would give yourself to God just as you are right now with your fightings and your fears, your hates, your loves, your pride, and your shame. And she answered, I would come to God just as I am? Is that what you're saying? Charlotte did come to nut God. On that very day, with all of her bitterness, with all of her brokenness, with all of the spite that she had against God and against everything that God had brought her to, she came just as she was. It was several years later that her brother, Henry Elliott, a minister, was raising funds for a school uh, for the children of poor clergymen. And um, Charlotte wrote a poem. And the poem was printed and sold all across England to provide money to educate the poor, um, the children of, of poor, poor preachers. And since that time, this poem has become the most famous invitational hymn in history. It started with a woman who said some things about God that were so distasteful that it embarrassed her family. Everybody got up from the table and left, except for the man who knew the cure. And you know the invitation. And you know that's how you've got to come to Jesus. You know that you've got to bring who you are. You've got to bring what you've got without one plea. Come just as you are. Will you stand and sing? All right, come on. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. We're about to take up our tithes and offerings, so if you could, please be sure to get your money ready. And also, I think I'd like to take a moment to thank those who have already given online and through the app. It's a good day, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you so much for the guys watching on Facebook. Please like, please follow us if you, if you like what you watch today. We'll go ahead and pray. God, thank you. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for giving, thank you for giving us today. Thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. I ask you to watch over us and keep us close and safe within your arms. Thank you so much, dear God. We love you and praise you and we thank you. Amen. Kids wanted to welcome all the newcomers here. Just have a couple of announcements. Uh, if you're new here, you should have gotten a connection card. It's kind of a long slip of paper. If you want to go ahead and just fill it out. And at the end of church, 
Bring it to the back. We've got free t-shirts for you. We'd like to get to know you and see how we can minister to you and your family and get you guys involved. We have a uh, missions conference Sunday, June 30th. Next Sunday. I'm sorry. Oh, that's what you want. Missions offering. End of every month, last Sunday of every month, we do a second offering for missions. So that's coming up next Sunday. And then July 7th, the following week after church, will be a family meeting. And the church meetings are not boring. Let's talk about 10 million things. They're more of just a chance to get together, share some ideas, uh, get some uh, stats on how things are going, and just be together as a family. Okay, let's pray. And we'll dismiss. Father, we do acknowledge our bitterness, Lord, as we look at our lives. We sure think we deserve it, Lord. We hold on to it because look at what happened. Look at what someone did to me. Look what I didn't deserve. And Lord, in my own life, that happens too often. And Father, when I think about the one who came who was perfect, he had every right to be bitter at everything that happened at all we did to him. But Jesus took it on himself, never, never spoke a harsh word to those people. He just continued to love, continued to share, and continued to live his life. He didn't go around blaming. Lord, help us to do that. Help us to get to the roots. Help us to understand how we can be better people, how we can be more loving, and how we can share the gospel, and not how we can make ourselves feel better and hold on to bitterness, Lord. I thank you for your word that helps us and teaches us, and I thank you for your spirit that convicts us. Lord, make us better. Help us to honor you. We love you, Lord. 